the role of government-sponsored enterprises in the economy. Uh, for the sake of specificity, uh, I have decided to focus directly on Freddie Mac and Fannie Mae, uh, two mortgage associations um, that possess federal charters. Government-sponsored enterprises, also known as GSEs, represent one of the most perplexing dynamic pieces of the American economy. These institutions occupy a special place in private markets due in part to their federal charter. They are accountable to shareholders through their mission to maximize profits in private markets, but are scrutinized by the government to achieve public policy goals and were first chartered by Congress. As a result, it is up for debate whether GSCs such as FNMA and FHLMC leave the government liable in case of a blunder, often caused by investments erring on the riskier end. According to a report published by the United States government, GSCs such as the Federal National Mortgage Association, Fannie Mae, and the Federal Home Loan Mortgage Corporation, Freddie Mac, specialize in priving mortgage credit to low and moderate income households by increasing the liquidity of the re residential mortgage market. These enterprises primarily operate in what is known as secondary markets. Secondary markets are often referred to in simpler terms as the stock market, such as the New York Stock Exchange, NASDAQ, and the London Stock Exchange. In the stock market, securities, stocks, and bonds are traded following their initial public offering on primary capital markets. GSEs play a pivotal role in these markets by engaging in what is known as securitization. Investopedia explains securitization in relation to the activity of government-sponsored enterprises as the pooling of various forms of contractual debt, in this case residential mortgages that represent collateral from mortgage-backed securities issued by aggregators such as Freddie Mac and Fannie Mae. Um, so in other terms, basically these mortgage-backed securities uh, packaged up by Freddie Mac and Fannie Mae are sold on secondary markets after Freddie and Fannie buy these loans from banks. Each of the two oftentimes engage in identical business ventures uh, and thus compete with one another as both purchase loans from various banks, pool the loans into mortgage-backed securities as previously mentioned, and either distribute these securities to investors through secondary markets or incorporate them into their own portfolios. The two entities essentially act as intermediaries between mortgage lenders and home buyers while facilitating simplistic methods of access for mortgage lenders when examining their mortgage portfolios and thereby increasing the willingness to make loans. Identifying as both private and public establishments, GSEs answer to both shareholders and government regulators. Prior to the financial crisis of 2008, Freddie Mac and Fannie Mae, while protected by the full faith of the U.S. government, um, I guess implicitly, were encouraged to engage in excessive risk-taking by extending credit to some prime borrowers. In an article by the New York Times, referenced on Piazza by Dr. Liu, Fannie Mae was reportedly pressured and increasingly scrutinized by the Clinton administration to extend mortgage credit to those who did not qualify for conventional loans. It is interesting to point out, though, that FNMA was founded on the premise that it would provide adequate housing for low- and moderate-income households and in later legislation, specifically, Federal Housing Enterprises Financial Safety and Soundness Act of 1992 allocate a fixed percentage of mortgage purchases to these households. With shareholder pressure to maintain profits also on the rise, providing credit to unqualified individuals with unsatisfac unsatisfactory credit ratings deemed unproblematic and average home prices in the United States more than doubled in a span of eight years, according to the History of the Federal Reserve website. Uh, this is also known as the housing bubble, due to the fact that prices were so enormously high and didn't accurately reflect, reflect the actual values of the houses. Um, moral hazard categorized the situation from the start due to the notion that a government bailout would be imminent if low-income households defaulted on their loans. So, basically, uh, these... GSEs could act in a hazardous way and um, make investments that were incredibly risky due to the fact that they knew that they would be bailed out uh, if something went wrong. Um, because of the uniformity 
uh, instruction and objectives to Freddie Mac, even though FHLMC primarily represents savings and loan institutions. An indistinguishable situation began to transpire, prompting a government bailout of $188 billion under the Treasured Preferred Stock Purchase Agreements to remain in operation, according to a published volume from the National Bureau of Economic Research. To address the scale of the situation, though, the same NBER volume states that GSE combined holdings of whole mortgages and mortgage-backed securities have consistently represented a minute share of the total U.S. home mortgages outstanding in comparison to those of depository institutions and market investors. As we, as we will see in, in uh, the presentation later, um, there were other institutions that really played a major role in this financial crisis, um, such as Goldman Sachs and um, Lehman Brothers. It is often difficult to mention the financial crisis and not mention the role that various institutions played in its development and the effects absorbed by these institutions because of it. While each of the two government-sponsored enterprises' roles in the recession is often debated, none is None is as obvious as the failure of the investment bank Lehman Brothers, although Freddie Mac and Fannie Mae are still experiencing the recession, recession's repercussions. For instance, uh, Goldman Sachs actually would distribute these toxic loans to investors um, and actually bet that the market was going to tank. Um, so when the market tanked, actually, they did profit from it. Um, the result of this financial disaster was a federal bail bailout of Freddie and Fannie, as previously mentioned, in which FNMA preferred stock in mortgage-backed securities was purchased by the Treasury for roughly $116 billion, along with similar purchases of FHLMC in the realm of $71 billion. Moreover, FNMA and FHLMC were both transformed into conservatorships, as opposed to the profit-maximizing private status that they held previously. In other words, the U.S. Treasury essentially added the two enterprises to their balance sheet, transfer transferring all future profits not to shareholders, but to the government, making shareholder stock worthless. Today, Freddie Mac has repaid the federal government, the amount of the bailout and then some, roughly $90 billion, but are still under the vast umbrella of government super supervision, as is Fannie Mae, due to the uncertainty over whether the two are able to maintain U.S. mortgage market stability. The National Bureau of Economic Regulation states that upon extensive research of academic literature, GSE housing goals were not a primary source of the subprime crisis, which is super, super interesting. <clears throat> The shockwaves of the multiple bailouts issued by the federal government were devastating for taxpayers, and unemployment began, began soaring to frightening levels as demand for labor nosedived. According to the Bureau of Labor Statistics, in the months after the recession, unemployment floated around 10% as the number of job openings decreased to staggering 44%. Additionally, American financial instability depressed global markets and countries began to withdraw funds from the United States as a result. As stated by the loanable funds theory, this massive decrease in net capital inflows, also known as capital flight, shifted the supply of loans back and led to skyrocketing interest rates. It is important to note that in an age of skyrocketing globalization, thanks to easier transmission of information, and internet access, nations are much more dependent on the state of one another's economies, as evident by the ripple effects felt throughout the world. The supply of credit was collateral damage as lenders choked off credit supply, prompting chair of the Federal Reserve at the time, Ben Bernanke, to engage in massive quantitative easing in order to stimulate consumer demand and lower interest rates, also known as large-scale asset purchase programs. By purchasing treasury bonds with maturities of 10 years or more, interest rates were driven down, thereby encouraging borrowers to continue borrowing into the foreseeable future. According to the liquidity preference model, through his injection of funds into the economy, Bernanke intended to shift the money supply out in order to reach a lower point along the money demand curve, ultimately corresponding to lower interest rates along the y-axis, 
spurring businesses to make new investments and people to purchase assets such as homes or cars. In the next cycle of events, aggregate demand predictably would increase with respect to short-run aggregate supply. Normally, during a recession, the Fed's decrease of the federal funds rate towards the zero lower bound would see rightward movements of the demand curve and drops in unemployment, but the liquidity trap headlined uh, major movements or minor movements in unemployment represented a major obstacle for the Federal Reserve. On a similar note, inflation did not respond to the mass purchases of government debt and injection of funds into the money supply as it usually does, remaining at moderately low levels. According to Vox, this unexpected immobility could be explained by banking activity in which holding onto excess reserves is more appealing than lending until the reserve requirement restriction is reached. The Fed encouraged these actions by awarding banks interest on their excess reserves, providing them an incentive to avoid lending. Finally, a committee under the umbrella of the Federal Reserve, known as the Federal Open Market Committee, began iterating to the public that it would maintain downward pressure on interest rates into the late future to calm public anxiety, the strategy referred to as forward guidance. Right here, as mentioned previously depicted, are the liquidity preference theory and the loanable funds theory. I think it's super interesting to point out that both of these theories actually interact in this scenario. Uh, to begin with, I feel that, um, or it actually is a fact, uh, that during this situation, the United, United States economy was su in such a poor position uh, that many foreign investors and other nations actually pulled their money out of the United States. Um, therefore, the confidence of foreign investors and savings rates actually went up abroad. Therefore, the supply of loanable funds in the U.S., uh, shifted back and the interest rate increased as a result. Um, because of this, uh, it actually prompted Federal Reserve Chair Ben Bernanke to respond by engaging in massive, massive programs of quantitative easing. Um, this quantitative easing uh, would provide a ton of funds into the American economy with simply a click of a button and the money supply would shift out. Um, and based on the graph in the top left-hand corner, um, based on the liquidity preference theory, uh, this would actually shift out the money supply, decreasing the interest rate. Um, as mentioned, mentioned pre previously, this decrease in interest rate would make it easier for consumers to borrow and especially for cars and homes and many assets that must be paid over a longer period of time that require loans. Um, so on the right, we could actually see the impact of this increase in aggregate demand uh, in which the price level increases um, and unemployment is usually supposed to respond to this increase in inflation um, by decreasing just because so many people are purchasing goods and there are more jobs available because pe people are purchasing goods. Uh, so aggregate supply would shift back just because demand is so high. Um, so we eventually reach a point higher along the long run aggregate supply curve and the price level has actually increased as a result. Um, as it pertains to this scenario though, this isn't exactly what occurred as mentioned previously is unemployment didn't respond too much and inflation didn't actually um, respond that much either, which is super interesting. Um, so the Federal Reserve had to respond by, uh, by assuring consumers that interest rates would be low for the near future um, to ultimately even stimulate the economy even more. Ultimately, because of the ongoing uncertainty associated with government-sponsored enterprises, one might ask whether or not the benefits of maintaining these institutions outweigh the costs. Those in favor of having a federally chartered entity intervene in the private market will often refer to GSE's ability to provide liquidity through 30-year mortgages that banks wouldn't provide if not for the intervention of Freddie Mac and Fannie Mae. If it weren't for the two, <clears throat> these 30-year mortgage, mortgages would be unhedgeable meaning that one would be unable to marginalize risk and banks would not have anywhere to exchange these mortgages. 
proponents would go on to state that there must be a buyer for these mortgages in order to promote incidents of home ownership and thus allow for banks to remove these long-term mortgages from their balance sheet, or else these mortgages would sit on their balance, sheet, balance sheets virtually for the 30-year period that define them. FNMA and FHLMC inject the liquidity needed into the housing market for banks to extend credit willingly to families that would be unable to afford home ownership if banks choked off supply and increased interest rates on these loans. <clears throat> on the opposing side of the matter, detractors might point to the fact that government intervention isn't necessary for market stability and free market ideologies rule supreme. Furthermore, Without government entities interwoven into the dynamics of secondary markets, free market ideologies propose that interest rates are determined by the natural supply and demand of investors. Moreover, in a free market, the prices for goods and services, in this case mortgage loans, are regulated by consumers as well as the market. When applied to the housing market, banks would sell loans on Wall Street to investors with little consistency and interest rates would fluctuate to in response to investors' decisions. The reality of American economics, though, is that we live in a mixed economy in which government economic initiatives interact with free market economics to ensure stability. Consequently, antagonists of government involvement must settle with the existence of federally chartered entities to ensure market balance for American citizens. So, for instance, in this political cartoon depicted on the slide here, uh, we see Freddie Mac, we see Fannie Mae, a taxpayer, and Uncle Sam. Um, so Uncle Sam is saying to the taxpayer, they're out of money, so you lose. Um, this is actually a pro-free market um, political cartoon due to the fact that if Freddie, Ma Freddie Mac and Fannie Mae didn't exist, then the taxpayer wouldn't lose. Um, just because uh, the United States government had to bail out Freddie Mac and Fannie Mae Fannie Mae was so much money, um, but where did this money come from? And I think what this political cartoon is implying is that this money came from taxpayers, uh, and taxpayers had to bear the burden of bailouts of many of the major institutions, uh, especially banks that are quote-unquote too big to fail, um, which represents a major, major problem in the system today and why Freddie Mac and Fannie Mae are under a lot of scrutiny. So basically, free market economists um, believe that uh, in a liberal democracy, capital should be able to flow freely, and interest rates should be determined by supply and demand. Um, and those investors on Wall Street should be able to determine this. Uh, in reality, though, it definitely it's definitely an interesting, interesting ideology, but... Um, Interest rates would fluctuate in extraordinary ways, and incidents of home ownership would decrease drastically uh, just because interest rates would fly up and fly down, and there would be no stability in the system. Um, and that is where Freddie Mac and Fannie Mae intervene. The multifaceted role of government sponsored enterprises in the housing market is capped off by their relationship with the government. At the moment, Freddie Mac and Fannie Mae remain on the federal balance sheet, and it remains to be seen if they will be rolled off of it anytime soon. As previously mentioned, the U.S. Treasury invested billions into the two to ensure market stability when the housing market was essentially at its trough. One can assume, then, that an, that an implied guarantee from, from those in Washington existed prior to the collapse that Freddie and Fannie would be insured in the case of an economic disaster. Furthermore, it remains to be seen whether or not each will have the ability to become accountable to private shareholders and attempt to maximize profits even after repaying the amount of their respective bailouts and more. Um, so in one of, the, one of the little points on this slide, um, we see that... Uh, an example of this is, for instance, that the government bailout of Freddie Mac um, totaled $71 billion, which is ridiculous. That's a ton of money. And Freddie Mac has actually sent $90 billion back to the Treasury. Um, it's interesting to point out, though, that 
another point on this slide says that all profits are assumed by the government. Um, so there are virtually no shareholders, and Freddie Mac and Fannie Mae are essentially um, not even government sponsored anymore. They are government enterprises, which is pretty interesting. <clears throat> Government-sponsored enterprises galvanize American secondary markets by stimulating demand for affordable housing intended primarily for those residing among middle-class income levels. Their status of stable and secure institutions has been increasingly scrutinized since the Great Recession of 2008, even though ex the extent of their role in the recession remains up for debate. Despite the blunder, GSEs remain an integral component of mortgage affordability by offering to purchase longer-term mortgages from banks so that, so that these banks, in turn, are able to navigate their balance sheet with ease. Furthermore, with the flexibility banks need to comfortably lend to borrowers in coalition with the consistent and affordable interest rates dealt to borrowers, every player seems to benefit from the involvement of an intermediary. There are, of course, caveats to the idea of a federally chartered entity intervening in market activity, as many with free market sentiments feel that the market must be left to act on its own, and interest rates will be determined accordingly to account for supply and demand. Markets are incredibly potent and possess the authority to dictate the manner in which people live, necessitating free, necessitating federal in intervention in certain facets of economic activity. Government-sponsored enterprises possess process of securitization and creation of mortgage-backed securities is extraordinarily interesting, and it remains to be seen if the government loosens their hold on these institutions in the near future. GSEs such as Freddie Mac and Fannie Mae often act among the shadows, providing American citizens the security, the security they need to purchase monumental assets, specifically housing and banks the flexibility that they necessitate to provide substantial loans so at the end of the day, everyone prospers.